uh, this morning. We're going to continue in this series from the book of Nehemiah this morning. Um, we are fairly, um, we're fairly deep into the story of Nehemiah and the return of the nation of Israel, the descendants of Israel uh, to um, the promised land. And so I invite you to grab uh, maybe a note card from the rack in front of you if you'd like to take some notes and follow along. I want to encourage you to do that. Um, and um, before we jump into this, though, would you just take a moment? Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. God, we are grateful for um, this time that our students had, um, Lord, to serve uh, others, to make a difference. Lord, and to do it in a way, uh, Lord, where you reveal that some of the greatest needs, God, they're really in our own backyard. And God, some of the greatest reward comes from sacrifice and serving others. Lord, a chance to take our eyes off of ourselves, be like you, or to look like Jesus as we serve. Thank you for... Uh, just being with them, giving them a, a, an incredibly powerful week. And God, as several of them said, uh, Lord, that really wasn't the plan at the beginning. It was to do something different. But God, it's so good to know that you are sovereign. And you can take our changed plans, Lord, and you can do miracles. Um, we thank you for that. We thank you for being our God, no matter what the circumstance. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. How many of you have ever heard of the name Jim Henson? Does that name sound familiar to you, Jim Henson? Uh, he is the man who introduced to what to the world? The Muppets, right? He introduced the Muppets to the world. He and another guy by the name of Frank Oz, actually, um, they've been compared to some of the great historical comedy duos like Maybe you've heard of Abbott and Costello, um, or maybe Laurel and Hardy, which goes back a little bit further, even in the 20th century. But Jim Henson most famously portrayed Kermit the Frog, right? He was Kermit the Frog. He was Bert, Cookie Monster. Um, he played Os Oscar the Grouch. But Jim Henson passed away in 1990. Frank Oz, though, he continued to portray some of the other characters, like Miss Piggy. Um, he was also Fozzie Bear, Bert, and he also was Grover. But in the early 2000s, Frank Oz, he sort of disappeared from the Muppet scene. Disney acquired the Muppets in about 2004, and there were a lot of people who are part of the Muppet world, including Frank Oz, they kind of feel like the franchise kind of lost its soul a little bit. And consequently, some of the audience kind of went away. And in an interview, Frank Oz said this. He said, the soul of the Muppets, it's not there. He said, the soul is what makes things grow and be funny. Once, Frank Oz was asked how Disney could kind of salvage the, the franchise of the Muppets. And the person who was interviewing Frank Oz, they suggested the possibility of hiring maybe kind of a unique and creative soul to, to come in and do something new with the Muppets. And Frank Oz said this. He said, I don't think the answer is to do something new. I think the answer is to go back to be true to who they are. There's nothing new to do except to dig deeper into, into their purity, into their innocence, because that's what speaks to the audience. The problem was, Frank Oz said, in my opinion, was that they were trying to do something new. You know, in some ways I think what Frank Oz says is pretty wise counsel, even for us in the church in the 21st century. Maybe, maybe it's not always about trying to do something new, but the answer might be about going back and being true to who you need to be, you're supposed to be. 
And we're at a place in the story of Nehemiah, the builder of broken walls, where this is actually what begins to happen. There's a call, there's this invitation, kind of a sacred summons for the nation of Israel, after all that God has sustained them through, after all that they have done that's impaired, that's kind of crippled their relationship with God, they're actually summoned to go back and to be true to who they are. Here's what I want you to remember when we're done today. When we engage in the work that God calls us to and begin to experience good things happening, good things happening, it's critical that we remember to turn our face toward God and to commit to giving Him glory and honor with our whole lives. Here's where we begin. There's this call in Nehemiah chapter 8. There's kind of this call to celebrate. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 9. We read these words. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people, said to them all, This is a day holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And then a little bit later on, in verse 16, in the same chapter, here's what happened. So the people, they went out and they brought back branches and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs and in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate, and one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. And from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated like this. And their joy was great day after day from the first day to the last. Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days. And on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. Nehemiah again here, is demonstrating kind of his unique abilities as a leader. He, 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 he immediately picks up on, he sees what's happening to the people as they are hearing this scribe, Ezra. He's reading, the Levites are sharing with them from the law of Moses, and it's clear that what they're hearing is about what they must do. And it's the exact opposite of what they have been doing. And they've not been living according to the law that demands that, uh, that the nation live in. They are, in fact, they're grief-stricken regarding their stunning collective failure to be obedient to the law. There's this old illustration that kind of, I think, helps bring into sharp focus exactly what's happening here and what happens to us, what takes place in our lives when when, when God calls his, his people to do and to be something, particularly in the Bible, it's kind of like looking in a mirror. It's a little bit like looking in a mirror. Speaking of which, how many of you used a mirror today? That's what I thought. No, I'm just teasing. How many of you, how many of you seriously, did you look at a mirror you recall at some point looking in a mirror at home, in a rear view mirror, in a side view mirror? It's kind of amazing. Mirrors are all around us, aren't they? But did you know, did you know, that when you use a mirror, there are three basic things you see. Three basic things. There's the mirror itself, right? You see the mirror itself. There's also your individual reflection that you see in the mirror. What's the third thing you see in a mirror? Anybody know? What's the third thing? You see everything else. You see what's around you. And in this case, the people of Israel are struck and they weep because as they're hearing the Scripture being read, they see that there's the Word. They're hearing the Word, but they also recognize that 
it's revealing to them their current lifestyles and that they are not in accordance with what God has called for. And because they're experiencing this hearing of Scripture, which is acting as a mirror, it's revealing the power, the majesty of God, this incredible bright light of God's holiness. It throws a glaring light on their impurity. They're hearing God's Word being faithful versus their continual betrayal. They're hearing about His great compassion as opposed to their self-centeredness. And it breaks them. It crushes them as a whole. And yet, and yet, Nehemiah in this instance points to, he, he calls out to the people to instead, wait, 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 he said, wait, instead, instead, I want you to be filled with joy. And he proclaims in verse 10, he says, because this day, this day, is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Why do you think he would say that at at that moment? You might, maybe you think, well, they should feel bad. They should feel guilty. They should be sorry. The key is actually found, though, in verse 11, the very next verse. This is what we read. The Levites, they calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. But why? Why would he? Why would he? Why wouldn't you grieve when you recognize how, how much you've fallen short of what God calls for? Here's why. Because even in their great sin, even in our sin, there's forgiveness. Because that's the kind of God we serve. We can celebrate because we have a God who says this, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. I don't know about you, but I love that image of God. It's not a day for grieving. Nehemiah and the Levites, they make it clear. And instead, they call the nation, be grateful. Be grateful for the way that God has delivered you in the past. This festival we read about in these verses, beginning in verses 16 through 18, it's actually called the Feast of Tabernacles. I remember when I was an undergrad at a Christian college, and they talked about this thing called the Feast of Tabernacles. I thought it was the weirdest name. The Feast of Tabernacles is what this whole account leads to. It was an annual reminder. The Feast of Tabernacles was an annual reminder of when the people were traveling on their way out of slavery in Egypt. And this is what they did during the Feast of Tabernacles. It was an opportunity to celebrate what God had done in the past. It was a chance to to tell the story to everyone around them about what God was doing in the present. The people all around them, they would no doubt wonder, what in the world is going on with these people who've moved to this new part of the world? to this part of the world, these new people, they're setting up all of these these crazy booths and they're using all of, what is this all about? This was a chance for the children of Israel to tell about the story of God's deliverance. And finally, finally, this this, uh, Feast of Tabernacles, it was really a chance to celebrate and proclaim confidence in their God for the future, for what was to come. God would take care of his people. So the first thing is this this call that comes to celebrate. But there's also another call, which totally lines up and makes sense with what's happening. There's a call to fast, a call to pray. Here's what we read in that passage, beginning in the next chapter, chapter 9. On the 24th day, so now 
a, a few weeks later. They've been celebrating and they've been commemorating God's deliverance. But now, uh, sometime later, in the same month, the Israelites gathered together fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord of their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter of, in confession and in worshiping their Lord. Let, this isn't in my notes, but uh, did you read that part where they stood for a quarter of the day? They just stood and listened to God. That's, that's a pretty serious commitment. <laughs> but then they also stood and confessed their sin as a, as a community, as a people. It was part of their worship of God. And then uh, standing on the stairs of the Levites, so standing there with them were Jeshua, Benai, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Bunai, Sherebiah, Bani, and Kenaniah. They cried out with loud voices to the Lord their God. And the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Benai, Hashabaniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pethaliah said, Stand up and praise the Lord your God who is from everlasting to everlasting. So now these different actions here in chapter 9 that the children, that the nation, the descendants of Israel are engaging in, they, they make sense when we, we, we refer back to the previous chapter, Nehemiah chapter 8. This is what happens after people have now heard the word of the Lord. Now we move on and we witness people respond. And they respond by confessing and worshiping the Lord their God. In this chapter we see people both confess their sin, they proclaim their faith. It seems that people are are hearing God's word, they're realizing that the problem is not God's expectations. The problem isn't that God expects something from us. No, the problem is rather there's been an unwillingness to live the kind of lives that God's called them to live. The words here are those of Israelite descent, they've separated themselves from all the foreigners. See, there were among the people, those who had disobeyed God, by bringing into their, their faith community, most likely through marriage, others who did not live by the law. And this had caused them to be compromised in their faith. And in order to get back on track spiritually, they're now ready. They're ready to fast. They're ready to pray. But why fast? In this moment, pray, yes, of course. But why abstain? Why abstain from food? Perhaps as um, someone I was reading, but her name is Macrina Whitaker. She said, fasting makes me vulnerable. It reminds me of my frailty. It reminds me to remember that if I am not fed, I will die. Standing before God hungry, I suddenly know who I am. I'm one who's poor. Called to be rich in a way that the world does not understand, I am one who's empty called to be filled with the goodness, the fullness of God. But there's something else. The nation, in verse 4, chapter 9, they've come and they've cried out with loud voices to the Lord their God. There's something that's unquestionably necessary when it comes to prayer. Sure, you know, impactful powerful prayer. It requires so many things. But the one thing that's unquestionable when it comes to prayer is time. Time is unquestionable. Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount regarding time. He said, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. In this account, 
the nation's efforts to strengthen their relationship, to renew their relationship with God. It's now made it, he's, he's made it possible for them to come and to live behind these rebuilt walls of Jerusalem, to inhabit this land and grow in relationship with him. How could they do that? It would be impossible if they did not commit to spend time with him. And the question I read this week is how could you possibly expect to enjoy someone's friendship if you only read what they were like and you only read about how good they've been with others, but you've never spent any time with them? That's what this fasting and prayer is all about, spending time with God. But here's the third and the last thing that this invitation extends. It extends a call to confess. So, we read this. Now, therefore, our God, the great God, mighty and awesome, who keeps his covenant of love, do not let all this hardship seem trifling in your eyes, the hardship that has come on us, our kings and leaders, on our priests and prophets, on our ancestors and all your people from the days of the kings of Assyria until today. In all that has happened to us, you've remained righteous. You have acted faithfully while we acted wickedly. Our kings, our leaders, our priests, and our ancestors did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or the statutes you warned them to keep. Even while they were in their kingdom, enjoying your great goodness to them in the spacious and fertile land you gave them. They did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. But we, but see, we are slaves today. Slaves in the land you gave our ancestors so they could eat its fruit and other good things it produces. Because of our sins, its abundant harvest goes to the kings you have placed over us. They rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. The nation realizes they've been not just disobedient, they've been repeatedly disobedient to God over and over and over again. And the people have gathered in this day and in this place. And they know they're not worthy of forgiveness. They are not asking for God's blessing in this portion of the story, but rather they're asking for God's mercy. And if you read this account a little bit more closely, more closely than we have time for today, you'll find that it is very specific in recounting their failure. They're not vague in detailing their sin. They use words like arrogant. They confess their failure to remember the miracles. They disobeyed God's law. And even so, they say this of God, you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully. We have what? What do they say about themselves? We've acted wickedly. Just a quick note, side note here. While the people are focused on their wrongdoing, it does seem a bit strange. It seems a bit strange that they spend so much time talking about the sin of their forefathers. I don't know if you caught that. Sins that they themselves They've not committed those sins. Why is that? Why are they talking about the sins of their forefathers? Here's why. They knew. They knew that the sins of their forefathers continued to impact their own sinful behavior in that day. The sins of their forefathers echoed into the future. The sins of way back then caused them to have a propensity to be trapped in a similar cycle of distressful sin themselves. 
And so they repent for the sins of their forefathers. Mike Rich said this, we see in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 40 through 42, a prescription that God gives the nation of Israel concerning how to break these generational, let's, let's call it that, generational sin and curses. This is what Moses wrote in Leviticus. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers and their treachery that they've committed against me and also in walking contrary to me, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and I will remember my covenant with Isaac and I will remember my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land. God is saying, God is saying that a sin enters your community and your community has struggled with it from generation to generation. The generation that's living needs to take the responsibility for it. We must identify ourselves with the generations before us, confess the sin, repent of it, then God will heal the land, and God will respond to that prayer. And finally, this time of confession. Well, it ends with the calling for recognition of their reality as God's people. Verse 38, in view of all this, the people say, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their seals to it. The people knew their history well. They recognized that in order not to repeat history, they must be a renewed people. But what about us? What about the church in the 21st century? Do we see a need where in all of this, in view of all of this, we need to make a binding agreement? As the nation of Israel, under the leadership of Nehemiah, looked to be revived in the 5th century before the coming of Christ, they knew they needed to make a change, to move in a new direction. What about us? Does the church need to be doing something differently? What sort of remaking are we talking about? Remodeling, renewing must we do? I, I love this quote. Renewing the church, renewing the church is like remodeling your house. It takes longer than you hoped, costs more than you planned, and makes a bigger mess than you ever thought possible. Recently, one of our vehicles was rear-ended, which is bad, but good, right? I mean, you'd rather, if you're going to have that kind of thing happen, you'd rather it not be your fault. The work of car shopping, however, ugh, I, don't, I don't know about how many of you love going to car dealerships, but I, put me like in a dentist chair or make me take a bunch of shots in my arm. One of the things that we all need to be aware of, though, is that there are literally, did you know, there are literally thousands of cars that are damaged or destroyed by floods every year. How many of you knew that? Every year, thousands of cars. But it would be a mistake to assume that all those vehicles end up in the junkyard. Some are repaired and they're resold. In other parts of the country, and a lot of times, people buy those cars and they don't know about the flood that happened to that car. In fact, how many of you have ever heard of Carfax? You can get the car with a Carfax. Well, Carfax says 452,000 flooded cars were put back on the roads in 2023. And in addition, down in Florida, Hurricane Ian, the atmospheric bomb cyclones that brought flooding to California, Nevada, Texas. It added more damaged cars to the road. As a matter of fact, another 53,000 water damaged cars are out there. The key takeaway is that you need to be vigilant when you buy a used car, even if you don't live near a storm area. That's because flood damaged cars are often transported well beyond the original region 
that the storms hit and consumers don't know what to look for. Water, water can wreak havoc on cars. It can lead to rusty floorboards. It can waterlog your electronics. It can compromise the safety systems of your car, damage the airbag controllers. It can take months or years. But eventually, that corrosion will find its way to your car's vital electronics. The long-term effects of water damage, it can haunt a car buyer's purchase for the life of the car. When we took our car, one of the first things they ask you for is they ask you for a title. The guy on the phone said, do you have a green title? I had no idea what he was talking about. I was like, no, the title's blue. What do you mean? No, what he meant was it clean? Did it have any stuff like water damage? The advice that's come from someone who knows about this kind of damage, its long-term impact, was this. This gentleman says, I would encourage people not to buy a car like that. That'd be the best advice. If it floods inside a car, Water damage is one of the worst types of damage. History matters. Our history matters. The nation of Israel knew their history as a people, as it related to their God. They knew it mattered. Yeah. Ending up with a car that has a history of being physically flood damaged. It's not good. It might harm you immediately, possibly, but it might not for a while. But eventually, that kind of damage, it will cost you. In the case of what we read here in Nehemiah, the history of the nation of Israel matters. There's been damage, both physical the walls of Jerusalem, and spiritual disobedience to the law. Generation after generation. And now, and now Nehemiah calls a sacred assembly in order that people gather together, confess their sin, be restored as God's chosen people, and that they would be a light to the other nations around them. What is God calling you to? Despite our history, <laughs> he's calling you to something. Are you ready to hear his voice? Pray with me, if you would. God, we are grateful that you call to us. Lord, we know that our lives, in and of themselves, God, they, they do not just line up with your word. No, God, we, we fall far short. And Lord, we do it habitually, much like we see the nation of Israel has done, but God, we are grateful for the examples that come to us from your word of how we can, we can make a change. We can be changed. You are loving. You welcome us to come back to you. You make a way where there seems to be no way because that is the kind of God that you are. God, may we May we act upon your gracious invitation to come to live for you, to live with you, and to be changed. We thank you for how you are just, that's just the kind of God that you are. 
We pray this in your son's name. Amen.